Allah Akbar Allah Akbar Allah Akbar Allah Akbar Allah أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمدا رسول الله أشهد أن محمدا رسول حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفناء صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين وسبحان الله العلي العظيم سبحان الله نحمده ونستعين به ونستهديه ونستنصره ونستغيثه فإنه حق من هذا الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على الحبيب المصطفى النبي الأمين 
المرسل رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله الأطهار الميامين وعلى صحبه المختارين اللهم يا رحمن يا رحيم يا رب العالمين اللهم لا تصغ قلوبنا بعد بعد اذ ان هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمه وافتح بيننا وبين قومنا وافتح بيننا وبين قومنا بالحق يا رب العالمين وانت خير الفاتحين ربنا واتنا ما وعدتنا على رسلك ولا تخزنا يوم القيامه ربنا عليك توكلنا واليك الابنا انبنا واليك المصير فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الابرار يا علي العظيم سبحانك سبحانك رب العزه عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين Today is the last Friday of this Ramadan. The last Jumu'ah. The last Jumu'ah in this year's in, in Ramadan. And yesterday, I saw a bit of news about a Palestinian sheikh. Uh, his name is Mahmoud Hassanat, who gave an exceedingly short khutbah. Basically, it consisted of the sheikh getting up and saying if 30,000 killed and 70,000 injured cannot wake up the ummah, then what can I say? And then he concluded the khutbah and that was it. And then he, they prayed Jummah. And I have to admit, I have that very same sentiment. What could there be more to say with an unfolding, ongoing genocide that even just yesterday in the Human Rights Council in the United Nations, which passed a resolution calling for an arms embargo against Israel. But the resolution calls for an arms embargo against Israel for a possible, the, the resolution is worded in a conditional way that there is an, it calls for an arms embargo against Israel by the Human Rights or the Human Rights Council resolution. It calls for the arms embargo because of evidence of a possible genocide. And 
Apparently, the resolution was introduced by Pakistan, but on the floor of the Human Rights Council, countries like Germany, which voted against the resolution, Germany, the United States, Britain, were among the six countries that voted against the Human Rights Council resolution. Very strongly objected to anyone accusing Israel of a genocide. And Germany made the very disingenuous argument that we cannot possibly say that Israel has committed a genocide until the International Criminal Court says so. And because the matter is under investigation under the, by the International Criminal Court, then we cannot possibly say that Israel has committed the genocide because the International Criminal Court have not spoken on the matter. Well, it's entirely disingenuous because everyone knows that the International Criminal Court will never speak on the matter, and that's because of the political pressures applied by Western powers applied upon the International Criminal Court to never investigate whether Israel has in fact committed a genocide or not. So Germany knows fully well that it is entirely disingenuous to say you can't accuse Israel of a genocide until our institutions, meaning the institutions of international law, investigate the matter when in fact these institutions will never be allowed to investigate the matter in any proper way or even improper way because of this, the pressure applied by the very same countries that voted against the resolution in the Human Rights Council. So the resolution passed in the Human Rights Council that conditionally worded resolution that calls for an arms embargo against Israel because of suspected, a suspected genocide. 28 votes in favor, six votes against, and 13 countries abstaining. And of course, Resolutions in the Human Rights Council are non-binding. They only have moral weight, so to speak. In other words, they are the voice of the common nations of the world. But they are not the, but the resolutions of the Human Rights Council is not the voice of the superpowers that yield actual weight and force and compulsion. They're not the permanent members of the Security Council, and so the voice of the Human Rights Council ultimately does not have binding authority. In a world like this, one is very much tempted to be like Sheikh Mahmoud Hassanat and to say, what possibly can I add, what possibly can I say if the daily images of slaughtered children 
the daily images of starvation and hunger and suffering and bloodshed does not wake up this ummah, then what is the point of yet another khutbah? And to make it perfectly succinct and sweet, and to simply say, let's pray and call it a day at that. Again, again, just again yesterday, we, 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 we just had Israel commit yet another atrocity of killing the um, unarmed, obviously, internationally protected workers of the international kitchen. People who are officially employed by the UN and the United States or the, the media outlets made a big to do about the Biden administration being very upset at Netanyahu for killing the, for, for the, the, the never-ending murder of international workers and making a big to-do of Biden's conference, phone conversation with Netanyahu, which reportedly Biden tells Netanyahu, if you don't stop killing international workers, the U.S. might get tough on Israel. And all of us know that this is all hard wash. And that when the U.S. gets tough in Israel, all the U.S. will do is perhaps delay shipments or a partial shipment of some limited number of weapons or arsenal that the U.S. has promised Israel. But the U.S. never in any real sense punishes Israel. And despite the fact that Israel is, had, is just fresh out of this yet another atrocity, I watched on screen, Israel, Israeli soldiers were filmed, caught on live camera, a horrific video in which aid is dropped from the air, these aid packages, that again, the, the Biden administration made a big deal about dropping into Gaza. Well, aid is dropped into Gaza, these aid packages, and Palestinian youth rushing to retrieve these aid packages. And the camera caught Israeli soldiers shooting and killing Palestinian youth as they tried to retrieve the aid package. And in the films that were pictured, it is clear that the Palestinian youth, they run to, to and they start attempting to unpack these aid packages. When the Israelis start firing at them and they run away and it's clear that they're not near any Israeli soldiers or not near any Israeli armaments or, what, or tanks or whatnot. It is clear that they're not armed. 
And it is also clear that once the Israeli soldiers wounded some of these Palestinians trying to retrieve these aid packages, that the Israeli soldiers prevented any other Palestinians from reaching the wounded Palestinians until they bled out and died. And it's all caught on camera. And it's right after the atrocity that was just committed of kill, killing UN aid workers working in an international kitchen designed to feed starving Palestinians. And right after the Biden administration is supposed to get mad at, at, at Netanyahu and supposed to talk tough at Net, Netanyahu, And of course, it's hardly surprising because you do not level entire blocks of civilian homes. You do not destroy graveyards. In fact, raise graveyards to the ground. You do not carry out executions in hospitals. And Western countries, the defenders, so-called defenders of human rights, basically not as much as even in any sense taking the principles of human rights or the Geneva Conventions seriously or even the, the obvious, undeniable violations of the Geneva Conventions. And if your soldiers basically see this pattern and practice for six months of absolute impunity when it comes to the murdering of Palestinians and the targeting of Palestinians, you're not going to take very seriously any belated talk about why did you kill these particular six UN aid workers as opposed to all the journalists, all the medical personnel, all the other civilians that you've killed for six months with very little going on. So I go back and I say, yes, one is very tempted to follow in the footsteps of the Palestinian Sheikh Mahmoud Hassanat. And to make this a very short and a very succinct khutbah, Except for a moral obligation to continue testifying, lest Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds one accountable for failure to make the testimony very clear and very outspoken. So it is the last Jum'ah in Ramadan. And as we have grown accustomed, Muslims generally have a short memory span. And the short memory span is because Muslims are not good students of history. And until Muslims remain 
bad students of history, until our history remains a subject of rhetoric and demagoguery rather than actual study and scrutiny and introspection. Those who are poor students of history are doomed to repeat the same mistakes of the past over and over and over until they become good students of history. But as we've grown accustomed, Israel again attacks, have grown accustomed to what Israel does in Jerusalem and at the Aqsa Mosque every Ramadan, especially the every, the every last 10 days of Ramadan, Israel attacks worshipers at Fajr with gas. There, Israel again implements no Palestinian male over 55 is allowed to, uh, under 55 is, allow, is allowed to go to the Aqsa Mosque. No female under 50 is allowed to go pray at the Aqsa Mosque. And again, Israel commits all types of violations against worshipers at the Aqsa Mosque. And you pause and you revisit this critical point that I've raised before, but it deserves revisiting because it is a critical point in history. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could not have been more clear about what Allah says when it comes to Muslims, Muslim obligation towards those who invade their homes and expel them from their lands. I mean, there are so many parts of the Quran that speak about al istidaf and about the obligation to fight those who fight you. But in the most clear statement of all, in Surah Al-Mumtahina, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explicitly says that Allah does not forbid you لَا نَهَكُمُ اللَّهَ عَنِ الَّذِينَ لم يقاتلوكم في الدين ولم يخرجوكم من دياركم أن تبروهم وتقصتوا إليهم that Allah does not forbid you from befriending and from allying yourself to anyone except those who fight fight you because of your faith, Islamophobia and the Islamophobia industry, which has become a cottage industry of Zionist organizations and Christian Zionist organizations. And that those who have expelled you from your homes. So the Quranic prescription is very clear. But yet we remain caught as Muslims collectively in this historical dynamic that has been ongoing like a repeated frame in some nightmarish film, a repeated frame of trauma loss, defeat, for at least several hundred years, at least the last 300 years, 
in the Muslim confrontation with colonialism. You pause at the historical moment, and if you are unable to analyze your current moment, you will not be able to analyze your past. And if you cannot analyze your past, then you will repeat the past, and you will continue suffering many moments like your historical moment. So last Juma in Ramadan, we see the same pattern and practice of Muslims worshiping at the Aqsa Mosque, being oppressed, being mistreated, abused, their liberties taken away at the Aqsa Mosque, and violence against Palestinians, again, lest we forget, the people of Gaza have not enjoyed peace for a very, very long time. It is the constant Israeli brutalization of Palestinians that ultimately led to the events of October 7th it didn't happen overnight. Palestinians didn't just wake up and say, let's attack Israelis who live close to us. Anyone that attempts to analyze the events of October 7th separated from years of brutalization and theft of Palestinian lands that have been going on for years is simply, to say the least, disingenuous. But it is of great significance that the entire Muslim world reports on and speaks about with great fervor and, yes, great hope about a phone call between Biden and Netanyahu. And as I previewed the various stations from Turkish to Saudi to Qatari to Egyptian to Iraqi to Jordanian, Everyone is talking about how Biden's tone of voice was a bit tougher on Netanyahu this time. And it is quite clear that the level of seriousness of analysis about the Biden-Netanyahu phone call far exceeds any type of attention given to anything a Muslim leader says or has said. So while Saudi channels will pro forma go over what the Royal Highness has said or the various Royal Highnesses have said or the Egyptian channel will go over what Sisi has said, and they talk about what their leaders say with greater reverence than they would about the Quran or about hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. In the Muslim world, yes, real reverence is paid to rulers and leaders, not to Allah or his prophet. But the reverence showed to Muslim leaders 
is an irrational reverence. It is a the dogmatic reverence. It is the pretense of reverence in a theatrical performance that says, we know our limits. We know that the symbols of power in our societies are untouchable. God is touchable. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is touchable. His prophet Muhammad is touchable. All the prophets are touchable, but not our rulers. But when it comes to analytical seriousness, in other words, actually analyzing words as if they make a difference in life, you see that type of attention paid to what you and I know are the figures that actually matter in this world. In this case, the phone conversation between Biden and Netanyahu. We'll pause for a second and add to the analysis the following. Pakistan, the main sponsor for the resolution of the resolution of, uh, uh, in, of the all, all arms embargo in the Human Rights Council. Pakistan, although it got, Pakistan and its supporters got 28 countries to vote for the resolution in the Human Rights Council, Western countries themselves treat a country like Pakistan with the type of not serious reverence, not serious reverence, that we would show our rulers and our leaders if we could. Why so? Because although Pakistan, Pakistan sponsored a resolution, and although Pakistan played a serious role in drafting this resolution, but Pakistan, like other countries, authoritarian countries, has a horrible standing in the Human Rights Council. And the very countries that voted with Pakistan know that Pakistan doesn't have much standing or legs to stand upon in the Human Rights Council because of an abysmal human rights record. But even more ironic and more paradoxical is that Pakistan, the sponsor, of that resolution itself represses pro-Palestinian expression in Pakistan. So pro-Palestinian demonstrations are banned in Pakistan, raising of Palestinian flags banned in Pakistan. And as a political activist, you could get into trouble as I looked at the list of countries that voted in favor of the resolution, countries that have a very dark and suspect relationship with human rights when it comes to their own citizens, like China, or countries in addition to a horrible human rights record, 
countries that themselves in their own policies do not treat Israel with any level of seriousness like Saudi Arabia or Egypt. In other words, countries that have not even closed down the Israeli embassy or cut off relations with Israel despite the ongoing genocide and countries that have failed to prevent shipments or the use of their airspace or land space to support and aid Israel in its ongoing genocide against Palestinians. One other element. So Israel, yet again, attacks an ancient, old country like Persia. It vi Israel, again, violates international law with impunity. And we all remember the type of language we've heard and grew up with, if you're my age, when the hostages were taken in the American embassy in Iran. And back then, people my age grew up with a steady dosage of language about how immune diplomatic missions are and sacrosanct diplomatic missions are and how no civilized country would ever attack a diplomatic mission. Well, that language has no use now that Israel has, in fact, bombed a diplomatic mission. And whether you call them military advisors or not, many of the people that were killed in the Iranian consulate in Syria were carriers of diplomatic passports. And yet, the world, again, has very low tolerance for the principles of international law or very low use for the principles of international law when those who are hurt are people we don't like very much in the US. And so although Israel bombs the Iranian consulate in Syria, there is very little in terms of consequences in the international system and although, as far as people in Malaysia demonstrating and outraged that Israel bombed a diplomatic mission in another Muslim country, killing whoever it kills. Yesterday, again, I was listening to the funeral proceedings. And the now extremely familiar, redundant, repetitive Iranian rhetoric about how the arrogant are, will pay the price and how in, the imperialists and the arrogant superpowers will be punished and as a Muslim, as I'm sure you have the same sentiments as well, we all know that yet again, there are no consequences. But you have to pause and you have to once again think about how we got here. And what are the possible venues to get out of the plight and the darkness that we have ended up in? Consider this.
China. In terms of population and in terms of economic potential, could be, could be a superpower that competes with the United States. But China will never be a superpower that competes with the United States. Despite the fact that China manufactures a great deal of the material that is sold and bought and used in the US, in terms of economic power, in terms of technological leverage, China will never compete. And to put it very bluntly, and for the sake of the type of brevity that Sheikh Hassanat prefers, China will never compete with the type of economic leverage that a country like the US has or the type of technological advancement that the US possesses. Because China will never attract the brain bank that the US is able to attract. Whether you are a gifted scientist in Pakistan or a gifted scientist indeed in Japan or South Korea, or a gifted scientist in China itself. All those who are gifted and truly brilliant, time and time again, are attracted to living either in the United States or Canada and perhaps European country, Western European country. And time and time again, we have been asking this question since Rafa'a Tahtawi traveled to Europe and came back dazzled and wrote his very famous work when he said, I see Islam in Europe, but I don't see Muslims. What Rafa'a Tahtawi wrote about was the work ethic and the ethic in diligence and deliberation. He was impressed that in Europe, he saw people that kept the streets clean, people who did their job, people who didn't ask for bribes, people who worked hard, did what they were supposed to do, although they were not Muslim. And he said, wow, this is an Islamic work ethic. But the difference between China and the United States is not the work ethic. It is not the work ethic. The difference between China and the United States is that the United States provides relatively more of a secret, powerful potion. relatively more of a secret, powerful potion. That secret, powerful potion is in extreme shortage in Muslim lands. And it's a potion that a baby in his or her crib understands and covets and desires. And that portion simply is freedom, liberty. The reason that scientists from Iran or Pakistan or Egypt or indeed China will come live in the United States 
because relative to China or Iran or Pakistan or Egypt, that scientist trusts the institutions of law and order that if someone more powerful than themselves treat them unfairly, they have a better chance. Nothing is perfect. There are no utopias. But they have a better chance of getting justice in the United States because there is relative to China more institutions of law and justice in the United States compared to China. And that the state will not impose, relative to China, again, will not impose rhetoric and demagoguery upon the scientists and simply leave the scientists to do his business unharassed and uninterrupted. So, while you are in Pakistan, while you are in Iran, while you are in China, doing your work, the thing that makes you anxious and worried all the time is that there are superiors that, come, that could come into the picture at any time and demand that you submit your agenda to their priorities. And there is no resort, there is no venue to address your grievance. So, in Pakistan, you can sponsor a human rights council resolution, but the very countries that either vote against you or for you know very well that you repress your own people and prevent them from supporting the same Palestinians that you are pretending to support into an inter, in an international body. Do you think England and the US do not know, and Israel, do not know that Pakistan bans pro-Palestinian demonstrations and bans the raising of Palestinian flags? Do you think they do not know that the Pakistani military is corrupt to the core? Do you think they do not know that every gifted Pakistani wants to leave Pakistan and go live in the United States and Canada where they can enjoy a greater degree of liberty and justice? No, they know it all. And so they don't take Pakistan very seriously. And same thing, as I watched the Israeli hysteria about Iranian retaliation, I can tell you all American diplomats and all Israeli diplomats know the tragic, in my opinion, truly tragic tragedy of Iran, one of the oldest nations in the world, and one of the greatest people in the world, Persians. Their energies absorbed in an entirely mindless and brainless conflict with neighbors that have been there for hundreds and thousands of years, Arabs. But why Iran will never be able to respond to the Israeli strike, one of the youngest nations in the world, a fragment of 
the Persian population, a minuscule country compared to the largeness of a country like Persia. And yet we all know that Israel can strike against Iran with impunity. And that all the rhetoric about the arrogance of imperialists and the arrogance, the istikbar of this and the istikbar of that is just that, demagoguery and rhetoric. And we all know it is demagoguery and rhetoric because the rulers of Iran do not have the means to retaliate. And they don't have the means to retaliate again because of the same phenomena that has existed for hundreds of years. Every gifted Iranian, every truly brilliant scientist, if given the choice, will leave Iran and go live in the West. And why will they leave Iran and go live in the West if given the chance? Because of the relative existence of law and order and justice and because of the relative existence of more liberty and freedom. Human beings are human beings. And we are always attracted to more liberty and freedom. And we are always attracted to more justice. We human beings know intuitively nothing is perfect. No one has a utopia, but we intuitively know that what draws us in, and especially the more brilliant we are and the more gifted we are, what always draws us in is the relative promise of more justice and the relative promise of more freedom. Because the rulers of Iran know that there is no freedom in their society. And because there is no freedom, there is no backtalk. They can engage in all the rhetoric and demagoguery they want. And no one is going to come back and say, are you delivering on what you've promised? The people of Iran cannot hold the rulers of Iran accountable for all their promises and threats. And the same with Saudi, and the same with Egypt, and the same with Pakistan, and the same with every darn Muslim country. And because there is no accountability, rulers learn to say anything and everything and not to take anything, any of it, seriously. But their people themselves, the very people that are there chanting and, and egging them on, and saying, Allahu Akbar, or saying whatever, praising the rulers in any way, also know that none of this speech is serious. In authoritarian countries, You learn not to take history very seriously, not to take words very seriously, ultimately not to take knowledge or sciences very seriously because everything is compromisable. Everything is subject to compromise and adaptation for the sake of those who hold absolute power. This is precisely why, although Israel is a young nation, Israel has some of the most advanced technology industries in the world. Israel manufactures its tanks and 
those who think that, oh, well, you know, well, bravo, the, the, the resistance have been able to destroy Israeli tanks. Yeah, you can destroy Israeli hardware, but what's important is Israeli technology and know-how remains. They'll build other tanks. That's the reality. That's the truth. The very painful truth. Iran doesn't build tanks, can't manufacture tanks. Pakistan can't manufacture tanks. Egypt can't manufacture tanks. All the Muslim countries put together can't manufacture a tank like the Merkava 4. So the truth of the matter is honesty in discourse, truth in discourse says that in Israel, all you have to do is watch their television and see how freely Israeli citizens criticize their rulers without fear of being arrested or without fear of disappearing. And because of that, yes, they might get a ruler like Netanyahu, but they will always have the mechanism of self-correction because of the relative existence of greater amount of liberty and justice in Israel as opposed to countries like Pakistan or Iran or Egypt. So here's the thing. Some of you, or whoever listens to me, have heard me fantasize about the rebirth of the Khilafah. But the Khilafah cannot come to be if it will embody the current state of Muslim ethics. The ethics of despotism, the ethics that is that of dishonesty in discourse, the ethics of ahistoricism and antipathy and hostility to understanding history, the ethics of blind scientism, in other words, the ethics of celebrating engineers and empirical scientists without understanding the empirical science, without, without a foundation of social sciences, good administration, good justice, good, good management of liberty, empirical sciences without these things is worthless. You can build homes, you can build homes, but without good social sciences, those who inhabit these homes will be broken people, will be oppressed people, will be a people without a spirit and without an intellect. So what have you achieved? If we Muslims have the engineers to construct homes, but not to administer the lives of the people who fill these homes, the institution that inherits Mecca and Medina, the institution that inherits the struggle for the Masjid al-Aqsa must be inst an institution that celebrates human ingenuity and creativity and freedom and liberty 
and plurality and diversity. Otherwise, it would be entirely worthless, like all the Muslim institutions that have been built in the 20th century. وسبحان الله العلي العظيم والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه يا رب العالمين اللهم افتح بيننا وبين قومنا بالحق يا رب In the midst of this ongoing genocide, I see a number of Islamic um, scholars. These are scholars of Islamic theology and law. In the Muslim world, And they ha there has been an, a, a heated debate ongoing. Do you know what the debate is about? The debate is about whether an Imam in Nawawi, who is a great Shafi scholar, medieval, is a kafir or not a kafir. Why? Because of what Al Imam al Nawawi said about Sifatullah, the attributes of God. There is a hadith that I don't accept, but anyway, hadith that says Allah created Adam in Allah's image. Sort of like the. the the clear influence of Christianity, but anyway. And there has been a centuries-old debate about this hadith. And Imam al-Nawawi is among the imma in his book of theology that wrote whatever he wrote about, I don't want to get into it, about this hadith. And in the midst of a genocide and what is going in Gaza, A raging debate about the attributes of God and what the Imam al Nawawi said about the attributes of God and whether the Imam al Nawawi is a kafir or not a kafir, a respected scholar, not a respected scholar. The amount of schizophrenia and bizarreness, the same country that for decades, wherever you went, you confronted Saudi trained scholars who lectured you to no end about how women are a fitna and their voice is a fitna and mixing is a fitna. I watched on Saudi TV just a week ago, they invited a woman from Canada, interviewed on Saudi TV, who as an imama, she gives khutbas and leads taraweeh prayer. And where are all these Saudi shiyukh? This is on Saudi TV, a woman advocating that women should lead men in prayer. And women 
are allowed to give khutbahs at Jum'ah, not just, but in mixed gatherings. In other words, lead before men. And where are the, all the Saudi scholars who, and we all know the answer. Have these Saudi scholars overnight transformed their thinking and now realize the error of their ways? Absolutely not. But we all know that it is fear and oppression and repression that makes all these Saudi scholars sit back in resentment, watch what's going on, hate what's going on, and not be able to say a peep. If you raise children on the principles of oppression and self-denial and self-effacement, on the principles of dishonesty with the other, they will also be dishonest with themselves. If they are raised to mind power over principle, they will grow up with deformed personalities. People are very much like individuals. Put it very bluntly, it is honesty in discourse that fights off and resists the type of corruption that would deplete the resources that would have been available to manufacture or to preserve and develop the type of technology that allows the Israelis to manufacture a tank like the Merkava 4. You can destroy as many as you want of these tanks, but the Israelis will build more. Because it is a culture of freedom and investment in knowledge and investment in truth an investment in the dignity of a human being. This is why Israel, as colonialism has done, can strike against cultures of despotism, cultures of humiliation, cultures of indignity with impunity. As far back as when Alembi invaded Jerusalem, LMB in his own diaries, in his analysis, actually in a report he sent back to England, says in analyzing the reason that they defeated the Ottoman forces, two things, and I'll close with this, two things LMB notes. One, he says, we had a reliable he doesn't use the word slave force, but I'll use it. We had a reliable slave force in obedient, diligent, hardworking Indians and Egyptians. 40,000 Egyptians did the dirty work of removing the excrement and the rubbish and the trash of the invading British army so that the army doesn't suffer disease outbreaks. Those Egyptians faithfully and diligently cleaned our poop and dug the roads for supplies to reach us. And when we needed any type of trench work, hard labor, digging, cleaning, the Egyptians did it for us. Muslims, 
LMB actually notes in his diaries the accommodations he made for the Egyptian force that is helping the British defeat their fellow Muslims in Jerusalem. There is no way an Elimbi could have subjugated 40,000 Egyptians in the service of the British army if those Egyptians were not broken people, broken because of despotism. They're not, these people weren't accustomed to thinking for themselves. They weren't accustomed to saying, we live by principle. So he says this is one reason for our, the, the, our victory. This Egyptian and Indian slave force that we brought along to conquer Jerusalem. The second thing LMB notes, he says, we had superior air power. Back in World War I, he says, superior air power made all the difference. Because the Ottomans were brave fighters and they fought very hard to defend Jerusalem. But ultimately, they were no match for our superior air power. And it blows my mind that from 2016 to our very day, Israel can go and bomb the, Israel, the, the Iranian consulate in Syria because of superior air power. And all these years, and Muslims who have been struck again and again and again and again and again by superior Western technology have done one thing really well and everything else miserably. The thing that they've done very well is export their best minds to the West. The most brilliant Iranians, the most brilliant Pakistanis, the most brilliant Egyptians, they all go build careers in the West. And as they sit there talking about whether an Imam al Nawawi was a Kafir or not, or go play house in their little Islamic centers that costed them $26 million, they have real good careers as scientists and doctors and engineers, and have miserable Islamic careers as they pretend to play house. Why do they come to the West? Because of the relative greater degree of justice and liberty. That's why they don't go to China. That's why they don't go to Russia. That's why they don't contribute to Chinese technological advancement. And that's why countries, and this is Allah's sunnah in this count, in this world, that countries with a greater degree of justice and human freedom. I'll close with this. You want the ultimate proof. Here is the ultimate proof. How often does the Quran talk about the hypocrites? How often does the Quran condemn throughout the Medina period, the hypocrites, the hypocrites, the hypocrites, the hypocrites. Time and time again, Allah threatens and warns the hypocrites. You are bad people. You are doing bad things. God will punish you in the year after. You are betraying the prophet. You've done horrible things. But why? Has Allah never commanded the Prophet 
to arrest the hypocrites or to expel the hypocrites from Medina. Why does Allah command the Prophet repeatedly don't hurt them. Tell them salam and walk away. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that what makes nations healthy and prosperous is freedom. And there is no way you can silence the hypocrites without teaching the populace at large cowardliness. There is no way that you can break the hypocrites through repression without breaking the entire population because of repression. And so, Allah, although this is a prophet and not just a ruler, doesn't allow the prophet والسلام, to repress the hypocrites, to arrest the hypocrites, to censor the hypocrites, to tell the hypocrites you don't have the right to speak. And this relative amount of liberty and justice as short-lived as it was, was enough to spark an entire civilization. Because that civilization had greater amount of liberty and justice than what came before it. And a greater amount of liberty and justice compared to the Byzantine civilization or the extinct Persian civilization. This is Allah's sunnah in Kaun. You want to prosper, seek justice, build the human being, establish their sense of dignity, give the human being security and freedom, and you will see what you reap in terms of creativity and ingenuity. And it is creativity and ingenuity that builds and empowers nations. It is creativity and ingenuity, human creativity and human ingenuity that prevents genocides and protects consulates and defeats superior or supreme air power. It is not rhetoric. It is not demagoguery. It is not a bunch of theater that we Muslims have become so good at. Allahumma afu anna. Allahumma khfir lana. Allahumma arhamna ya tawwab ya rahman ya rahim. Allahumma hadinna li akraba min hadha rashada ya kareem. Allah forgive our sins. Allahumma guide us to the righteous path, to the straight path. Allah enable us to be better Muslims, testifiers for the sake of justice and righteousness, upholders of human dignity and honor, not oppressors on this earth, and not despots in your kingdom. وصلي وسلم وبارك على محمد وعلى وصحبه وأقم الصلاة